Thank you. Stop it. I am, I'm a comedian and a cabaret performer, so speaking in front of people is actually something I do quite often. But when it came to doing a TEDx talk, that was something else to me because it is on my bucket list and has been for a long time. So you can imagine my complete disgust with myself when it got to about a week ago and you can see where this is going. I, <laughs> I realised that I'd done next to no work on this talk, but it wasn't just procrastination. It was like I was trying to sabotage myself, and I had to look at myself and go, what on earth are you doing? Like, you want this. You have wanted this for so long. Why are you not giving it everything you've got? And I realised that really what I was doing was kind of protecting myself. Because if I was honest with you, I will be honest with you right now, my greatest hope had always been that, okay, I would do this amazing TED Talk, it would be emotional, it would take everybody on a journey, uh, at the end, you know, there'd be a rousing standing ovation, we'd all sing Kumbaya, I <laughs> would like crowd surf to the back of the room, like, yeah, I'm bringing TED on your head, and then... <laughs> And then, of course, it would go online and it would go spectacularly viral. Uh, but not just that, it would have like comments from, you know, George673, who'd say things like, you know, I'm normally a hater, but this woman's turned my life around. <laughs> so clearly, I'm a very realistic person. But I thought, if I, if I go for this, like if I really put everything I've got into it and it fails, that's going to hurt. Whereas if I just kind of, yeah, I'm just going to keep that over there, and then if it doesn't go well, then I'm fine. I'm okay, because I didn't really care about it anyway. So this is what I want to talk to you about today, is how we have this very human, very natural desire to keep ourselves safe, but that when we do that, when we push things away and keep them at arm's length, there's actually a real cost to that. You know when you're uh, sitting on the plane, ready to take off, and they do the safety spiel, and they do the whole, you know, in the unlikely event of an emergency, you need to be familiar with the brace position? I always have the same thought when they get to that spot, which is, come on, guys, really? I mean, it might make you feel a little bit better, but if you're plummeting to Earth from 30,000 feet, like, is that really going to help? Right? No? <laughs> I, 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 as I say that to you, though, I realise I am a complete hypocrite because I've actually spent a majority of my life in the brace position. I'm not, no, not literally. That, uh, I've got a bad back. But I'll explain to you why. This is my mum, and that's me. Aren't I cute? And she, she was a single mum, so my whole, whole world. And I very creative, engaged, beautiful parent. I have very fond memories of her baking cookies with me and practising my jazz ballet routines in the front yard, and she taught me to sing. And when I was five years old, completely out of the blue, no warning at all, she died. She had uh, what's called a berry aneurysm. It's when a little blood vessel in your brain just bursts. So overnight, my whole heart had just been ripped out of my chest, and it was agony. So shortly after that, uh, my smaller sister and I went to live with our grandmother. She was a, a very complicated woman, but a very, very loving, warm and affectionate person, and she welcomed us into her family as, as her own daughters, and we soon be began to call her mum. Oh, that's... She's here with us now. Um... <laughs> Is this working? Should I go? That's all right. So, um, yeah, so she was our new mum, but this time... This time, I was adamant that I was never going to let what happened to me before happen ever again. And, and I don't mean that I was never going to let anyone around me die. I mean quite to the contrary. I was very aware that anybody I cared about could disappear at any time. And I was not going to feel that pain again. So I started to brace myself. I would never let anybody too close to me. 
Uh, where mum was concerned, I would do things like make mental plans of who I would call and where we would go if she suddenly dropped dead. I, I would uh, sneak into her room at night and just check to see if she was breathing. I would, uh, I would lie in my bed and actually try to recall and etch into my memory what her last words to me that evening were so that, you know, if she passed away in her sleep, I'd have that memory to cling on to. So I braced and I braced and I braced for 10 years, and for 20 years, for 30 years, she would not die. <laughs> I didn't want her to, but I was ready. I was ready. She was bulletproof. What is going on? She was there to see life events that I would never have even dared dream that she would be around for. She was there to see me graduate. She was there to see me get married, to see my beautiful children come into the world. Uh, she was there to see me pursue my dream of being a performer and following comedy. And I could probably actually procrastinate a whole other TEDx talk about how comedy is a fantastic tool for keeping people at an arm's length. But I won't. But she was there for all of it. Then one day I got a phone call and mum's health had just nosedived really quickly. So I went up to the hospital and it was very clear almost right away that this event, this life event that I'd been getting ready for my whole life was really just around the corner. So my sister and I concocted this plan where she and her family in their house welcomed me with my kids to move interstate up to live with them and we kind of set up this little commune in the suburbs so that we could bring mum home because the one thing she was adamant about was that she did not want to spend this last chapter of life in a hospital. She wanted to be with us and die at home. And so we brought her home with us. This is us doing our best fault in our stars impression. <laughs> Dying's very serious business. And we're missing a picture there. Oh, well, eerie. Just focus on the comedy that we're thin. Um, something... When you're looking after someone who you love so much and they're dying before your eyes, it's incredibly confronting and excruciating. But for me, it was also one of the most beautiful and profound experiences I've ever had in my whole life. And something really amazing happens, which is that even though this thing I've been bracing for is happening, I mean, this plane is going down, I stop trying to distance myself from it, and I actually just open up. And I tell her a dozen times a day how much I love her, and she gives it right back to me. <laughs> and, you know, we, we tell each other how much we've meant to each other, we reminisce, we hug, we kiss. There's just nothing, there's no distance now between us. Then one morning, She's been asleep for a few days, and so if you've gone through this process, you know that's the business end. And my sister and I are sitting either side of the bed, and my sister says to me, Jenny, look, look at her breathing. And I go closer, and sure enough, her breaths have gotten really deep, and there's huge spaces now between them. So we know that this is it. And we hold her hands and we just say over and over, thank you, Mum. And we love you. And in that moment, I have never felt so unbracing and so raw and so connected. So she dies, and it is agony. <laughs> but I'm OK. So in the time that follows her death, I start to think about trying to put my life back together. And I love performing so much, and I know that's what I want to do with my life, but 
I feel like I can't go back just to the way things were now because something's really profoundly shifted in me and I don't want to do that anymore. So through this stunning display of serendipity, I hear about an audition to be a clown doctor. And so for those of you who don't know, a clown doctor is usually a performer and they get trained to work in the hospital setting and really their job is to, to, to bring some comic relief into patients' lives, to bring distraction as well, so especially for people going undergoing troubling medical procedures and really just to bring some light into what can otherwise be a really dark time in someone's life. Do I have mascara running down my... Thank God, my vanity's got to be intact, guys. <laughs> so to my, uh, to my complete and utter delight, I get the job, and thank you, and I actually just recently graduated from my clown turnship, so I'm now... A <laughs> it's true. I am now a fully qualified clown doctor. This is me. <laughs> I'm Dr Jolly. Dr Angelina Jolly. And I, yeah, I did. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and I absolutely love this work so much. And often when people find out that I do this, one of the first things they say is, but how do you cope with the pain of that? Because that must be so awful, seeing kids who are in that much pain and are that sick. And that's an, a totally valid question. And I think... When I first uh, came into this line of work, I think my first thought was, I guess that you would just distance yourself a bit and kind of, um, you know, keep your boundaries up, not get too involved and just go a bit into robot mode when you need to. But what I have found is that to do this work well, the absolute opposite is true. When I first started working as a clown doctor, the artistic director uh, didn't say to me, our job's to be totally hilarious. And he didn't say, uh, you know, we're just there to take people away from their cares and worries. He said to me, our job is to show up with an open heart. And that can be really, really hard, but I know it is absolutely necessary if you want to have a real connection with someone. There's this great quote that I love from the author Jonathan Safran Foer, and it says, you cannot protect yourself from sadness without also protecting yourself from happiness. And I love that, but I would like to just tweak it a little bit for my purposes today, and that is to say that you cannot protect yourself from pain without also protecting yourself from connection. I remember this one day, uh, we were in the hospital. We work in pairs as clown doctors, so we were walking into this room, and it was one of those hospital rooms that has multiple beds, and they're just separated by curtains. And as we approached this closed curtain, I could just hear behind it what sounded like a woman crying. And I'll be completely honest with you, my first reaction was to go, no, nah, this, this is too hard. I don't want to, I don't want to upset whoever's there more. I don't want to make it worse. I don't want to upset myself with whatever's behind that curtain. Uh, what if I go in and they say, what are you doing? Get the hell out of here. I'm going to feel awful. It was just easier to, to just leave it. But then I thought, you know, you've got to turn up with an open heart, blah, 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 okay. So, <laughs> I, <laughs> so I, just, um, I just peeked through the curtain and there in the room, I could see a little crib, a little hospital crib, and in there was this tiny, tiny little baby, and there were tubes and wires, and next to it, on the bed, was a couple. And they were sitting there, and the man had his arm around the woman, and the woman just had her hand in her face, her hands over her face, rather, and she was just sobbing. And I just said, ding dong! And they looked up at me, suitably bewildered, because I looked like that. <laughs> and I just said, would you guys like a visit from a couple of idiots? And the woman just burst out laughing. And then she burst into tears again. And the man looked at her, and then he looked at me, and he said, you know what? 
why not? <laughs> and so, well, so we walked in, and my, my fellow clown doctor just gave her a little massage. We had these little turtle handheld massages. He just gave her a little massage on her shoulders, and I played my little watermelon ukulele, and I just said, you know, just imagine you're on a beach in Hawaii, and the sun's in your face, and the wind's in your hair, sand's in your togs, and it's all very silly. And she's laughing, and then she's crying, and then she's laughing, and she's crying. And this whole encounter lasts less than five minutes. But it has stayed with me because I feel like it's the perfect example of what incredibly meaningful and needed connection can happen if you're just willing to open up and allow space for it. I would love to end this TED talk with, here's my five tips for keeping an open heart in a cruel, cruel world. <laughs> but uh, I can't do that, because uh, I only started writing it last week. But um, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, no, I couldn't possibly. I have no idea what they are. I don't even know if those steps exist. But what I do know is that to, to stay open-hearted is a process, and, but it's a choice as well. And it's not just a choice that you make once and bam, I'm open-hearted now. It's something you constantly are confronted with when you find yourself pushing things away and trying to keep yourself safe. I mean, if just take a moment. I know this seems cheesy, but just look at the people next to you. Look at the people sitting next to you. <laughs> Every single person, we all have heartbreak and fear, we're either going through it now, we will go through it, or we've gone through it. There's sickness, pain. There are a million reasons in this lifetime to adopt the brace position and to protect yourself, and nobody could ever think worse of you for doing that. But what I do know for sure is that it is only when we can stop bracing ourselves that we can start embracing each other. Thank you very much.